I can't imagine a better time to have an innovation summit in pediatric medicine. Because as we'll talk about, I think we're, we're just at a tipping point in pediatrics in which a number of scientific innovations that have really occurred over the last 10 years or so are converging to completely change the way we think about pediatric disease, but also the way we treat pediatric disease. And, and of course, it starts with the Human Genome Project, because the Genome Project gave us, for the first time, the entire blueprint of all the 30 or 35,000 or so human genes that are the potential causes for human disease. And more importantly, it taught us about five or 7,000 new genes that are likely going to be the next new drug targets. You know, one of the amazing things for those of us in the industry is that most of the major drugs that have been developed to date have really been developed against just two or 300 targets. And yet we know now that there are 3,000 or 5,000 additional targets that we can actually go after to treat human disease. And that's going to change the way we think about new treatments. The second advance is one that's coming very quickly now. It's, it's the rapidity and the low cost of human DNA sequencing. Many people think that within three years or so, a human genome sequence will cost just $100 or $200 and will actually be done in a day. And so if you think about what that means, it means that I think most children born in the U.S. in three to five years will actually have their genome sequenced at birth. And so we'll know what their risk of disease is, not only as children, but as adults. So think about how that will change the way we think about human disease. Rather than waiting until people are adults, and treating them when they become symptomatic from their diabetes or their heart disease or their Alzheimer's disease, we'll actually know the day they're born that they have risk. And we'll start to think about treating children who are actually well children but who are at risk in a way to cure or prevent disease before it occurs. And that'll have profound implications on how children's medicine is practiced across the world. At the risk of doing a little crystal ball gazing, I put four predictions on, on this slide. By 2020, certainly, people will know their DNA sequence and risk of many diseases from birth. And so preventive medicine will become an important part of what we do. We'll therefore begin to concentrate on medicines that cure or prevent diseases as opposed to simply treating symptoms of diseases lifelong. And we'll have diagnostics devices and medicines that are developed together. In other words, we won't think about breast cancer as a single disease. It'll actually be six different genetic diseases. And we'll have a test that tells a woman whether she has disease A or disease B. And we'll have medicines that are specifically targeted to this geno genotype or this genetic type of breast cancer or that type of genetic breast cancer. Very different way of thinking about disease. We will have huge data sets from which to understand disease. But patients and physicians will have their own personalized data very rapidly. And they'll be monitoring their response to medicines at home, not in a physician's office. But it'll allow adjustments of therapies to be made very quickly and more efficiently. So all of this is good news. It's good news for adult patients, but the in interesting thing is a lot of this will move back into the pediatric arena. And, and so I think we need to begin to think about pediatric medicine uh, in a very different way. So today I thought I would tell you a story that I think is sort of the tip of the iceberg. It's the beginning of the revolution that I'm talking about. And it's a story about cystic fibrosis that goes back almost 20 years as an incredible collaboration between academic investigators, companies, including Vertex, uh, and patients and foundations, the CF Foundation. Patients who have CF can't hydrate the mucus in their lungs, and they get very thick and sticky mucus, which clogs their lungs. They get infections behind these obstructions, and they eventually, this eventually leads to pulmonary failure and death. And if you know patients with CF, you also know that this takes over these kids' lives and their families' lives, because the treatment requires every day two to four hours of various inhalation therapies, vibrating vests to try to clear this mucus, multiple hospitalizations, unfortunately, for these infections. This really dominates the, the life of these families. So the story that I'm going to tell you is one that not only involves scientific innovation, it really involves partnering innovation, like Sandy was talking about, because this was a partnership between a series of academic labs that did the basic science underlying our understanding of the disease, companies, and pr prominently in this case, Vertex, and very importantly, patients and a CF foundation that helped organize those patients and support the development of new drugs. The CF foundation was formed more than 30 years ago now to organize and help these families deal with their disease. They established regional treatment centers uh, very early on, one of them I think at Children's. Uh, so all these kids are treated in a very standardized way at, at less than 300 sites across the U.S. They made sure in the 1990s that all these children were genotyped. So every one of these kids knew what their mutation was. 
long before we had new therapies. And you'll see that was very important as we developed these therapies. The foundation raised a lot of money to fund basic research into the discovery of the gene. But then when the gene was discovered, they turned to developing new medicines. And they entered into very novel kinds of relationships with biotech companies, including Vertex, that were called venture philanthropy. They funded some of the early clinical development in exchange for future product royalties. So let me tell you this story. It goes back, actually, to 1989, when Francis Collins and Lap Chi Choi discovered that the CFTR gene and showed that it was mutations in this gene that caused CF in all patients with CF. Now, the initial news was sort of depressing, because as he and others began to look at the CFTR gene sequences in these patients, what they discovered was that there were more than 1,900 different mutations in this single gene that would cause CF. And not only that, they caused different kinds of CF in different patients. You know, we certainly couldn't develop 1,900 different medicines for these different patients. And so it took several years of, of really understanding the cell biology of this disease before we and others realized that you could actually bucket these mutations into a couple of big categories. The second breakthrough here was really made by Vertex scientists, and it was, a, it was an idea breakthrough as much as a technical breakthrough. And the notion was, rather than use traditional drug screening against the CFTR target itself, let's figure out how to grow cells from the lungs of these patients with CF and use the diseased cells themselves as the drug screen. And our scientists spent three or four years actually figuring out how to do it. It's not, not easy to grow these cells and developed a screen that we're, in which we actually use human bronchial epithelial cells from these different patients with known mutations to try to identify drugs that would treat the disease. On the left is a culture of human bronchial epithelial cells from a patient with one of those function mutations called G551D. And if we can play the first video, you'll see that these cells have cilia on the surface that are beating in a pretty anemic sort of way. And the reason for that is because they're coated with this thick mucus that prevents these hair-like cilia cells from, from beating. And then we drop drugs on these cells, on the video on the right, and you'll see the first drug that we discovered, it was pretty obvious that we had a dramatic effect. You see this rapid motion of the cilia, and the reason is because the mucus has been hydrated and cleared off of the surface. And I think it was particularly important that we use the cells from the patients, which were obviously generously made available to us from patients and the CF Foundation to do this. So the big question was, could we take that cell biology experiment and actually demonstrate clinical benefit from this same drug. And, and that's what I'm showing you here. This is the same drug I just showed you. It was Ivacafter on that slide. We call it Kaleidico now. It's, it's on the market. We gave Kaleidico to a set of patients with the G551D mutation shown on the right in a phase three study. And we measured their lung function over time compared to patients who were treated with a placebo. And you can see the placebo patients actually get slightly worse. But when we treat them with Kaleidico, we see this very rapid increase in lung function within two weeks. And most importantly, that increase in lung function is sustained for the entire 60 weeks of this particular clinical trial. When we take the placebo patients at the end of 48 weeks and we gave them Kaleidico, you see the similar increase in lung function, which was very encouraging, obviously, because it suggests that the effect is reproducible, robust, and real. So this story basically took 23 years. In 1989, the gene was discovered. 2012, we submitted Kaleidico to the FDA, and it was approved in less than three months, really one of the most rapid drug approvals in history. The good news was within nine months of approval, both here in the US and in Europe, more than 90% of all patients with the G551D patient now have access to Kaleidico and are taking this medicine. Now, a lot of people say to me, well, 23 years sounds like an awfully long time. To, to go from a gene to a drug. And I actually say it's actually a really short time, and it's going to get a lot shorter. You know, we've known about the gene that causes sickle cell anemia for 60-some years, and we've yet to develop a cure for that disease. But I think you're going to hear this story over and over again, and how do we all make sure that this next set of advances actually happens? And I'm a big believer in the kind of partnerships and ecosystem that she's talking about. These advances will not happen unless we nurture this entire ecosystem of medical innovation. And that ecosystem starts with basic research in academic labs supported by the NIH. It goes to companies. It goes to patients and advocacy groups. And then finally, uh, it goes to regulators who have to approve these drugs and payers who have to reimburse them. If we disturb any part of that ecosystem, we will actually break the engine, the innovation engine, that will produce this next generation of drugs. Thank you.